just tap into your will? And as you answered that question, there were a lot of ifs to the process. Can you give us your will and commitment and passion to ensure you see this through? What level does that stand at? Let me say um, it is very opportune. This should have been achieved perhaps 40 years ago. We have been behind. I believe possibly there was not much political will. But today, I think that there is political will. In respect of Sadak, as other uh, 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 panelists have said here, we are moving forward. There is huge integration in various aspects and uh, sub-sectors of the economy. We have moved forward, and we are committed. The issue is that the pace at which we are moving is the question which we all would want uh, Firstly, as a region, uh, SADC, and together with the rest of Africa, we should increase the pace. I believe that political commitment is there, but uh, the pace at which each individual member state may move may be the issue. But as far as my country is concerned, things are now different. Zimbabwe is open for business. <laughs> things are different. Zimbabwe is open for business. Miriam, let me come to you next in your perspective. Um, how could organizations like yours really ensure they're part and parcel of the process of making this work for Africa? Please. Well, thank you, Julie. I think that you were talking about preaching and evangelizing the whole panel, but I think it's uh, the whole continent that should be evangelized about the role of private sector from very small enterprises and companies to, to the large ones in the terms of the whole value chain that we can create from big companies to small companies. Well, I'm a business operator first, then I do represent the organization. There are many perspectives and uh, as an investor in Africa and, uh, and operator, um, there are a lot of barriers and at the same time, uh, mechanisms that should be p placed in place and they have been uh, delivering already and uh, addressing some uh, some uh, issues um, what we can we, what we see and say is that uh, our our uh, intra intra continental trade is very weak and in comparison to um, just south South America, 26%, we are only at 18%. And what we see is that our, uh, um, uh, how you say, our territories in terms of doing business is first very fragmented. Second, trust in good and, 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 uh, and, um, and um, commodities that are, co that are produced in Africa and we should consume and buy African products. And last but not least, trust Africa brand. We, I've heard some of the former panelists talking about buying an asset or a house in Leicester instead of one in uh, Casablanca or Djibouti or whatever. So I think this is, this is, this is uh, a mentality shift that we need. And us private sector, we have that flexibility we are more flexible in terms of adapting and in terms of being a, 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 a locomotive, an engine for, right. uh, for uh, creating wealth and jobs. Thank you very much. And we, we stay with that word trust, trust, trust. Ali, I'm going to come to you now for a, a private sector perspective, and I want you to tap into the infrastructure changes that you want to see to really be able to leverage the opportunity offered by this agreement. And when I say infrastructure, I do mean soft as well as hard. So what do you need to see, Ali, to be convinced as a business leader that this can work for Africa? What will Africa look like in 2063? And what are we then going to have to do, the private sector, the government, everybody, to actually make that success happen? And I've been thinking, and it should be because I was in India last week, I really take inspiration from that country. As Strive said, it has a population more or less the same as Africa today combined. It has, however, the incredible advantage of being a single market. 
with 1.2 billion people as a single, we are, we are a market of 55 countries with 1.2 billion people, different rules of trading and so on and so forth. But there's another observation I've made about India. That when you are in India, in cities, up country, wherever you go, what will strike you, especially as an African, is that almost everything from roads to machines to cars to phones to uh, machines in hospitals uh, to buildings, decor, furniture, everything that you see in India has kind of, is rough around the edges, is kind of crude, is not as perfect as we would like it to be. But what is more interesting is that almost everything you see in India is made in India by Indians for India and now increasingly for the rest of the world. And the reason they have been able to do that is because they made the right investments 60, 70 years ago. They made the right investments in education. They made the right investments in infrastructure. And of course, they protected their market. We here in Africa are going to have to really think very hard how we are going to achieve that, in addition to the challenge of trying to harmonize integrate and integrate our markets. Where are the people who are going to work those industries? Where are the technicians? Where are the resources coming from? The infrastructure we need in energy, in railroads, in roads, in communication uh, infrastructure that is going to make uh, uh, manufacturing happen, where are the resources going to come from? Who's going to build? So I think that it is very important also to make sure that come 2063, the industrialized Africa that we desire is also going to be owned by Africans. That is an incredibly difficult challenge and one that we shouldn't avoid. As you were speaking, Miriam was nodding her head and thank you for introducing the skills and the training into the conversation. I'm gonna stay with private sector for a moment. Tonya, I'll come to you now. And, um, you know, private sector has been known to be one of the, you know, sectors that has resisted this. And you do find in countries, certain business leaders going and advocating for controls, you know. Um, what then is the role of the private sector in ensuring that this can fly for Africa? Okay, so um, I see the private sector as simply the implementers. We're the, one that, we're the ones who implement. No matter how good a policy is, if you don't have the people who can take it, work it, test it, prove it, it's going to fail. And so the private sector's uh, achievement on the continent, especially the African private sector, has been that we've broken borders. A lot of what's been talked about, we've already been doing it. We've gone into countries, we've crossed borders, we've dealt with uh, cross languages and all of that, but we always find that we're competing, first of all, with our own governments, first, then we're competing amongst ourselves with different tribes and cultures and all of that which we compete. Then we compete with foreign companies that seem to have an advantage over us in our countries. And then we compete amongst ourselves. But irrespective of all of that, we've found that we always are at the forefront. So we know where those hurdles are. We know what needs to be done. But if we're going to put Africa forward and we're going to take all of this, then we have to really look at the infrastructure that, they have, uh, that the uh, business and private sector must drive. And one of the greatest infrastructure that I believe we must do now is create what we would call the digital highway. It's a digital infrastructure across boards. Once you can put the digital infrastructure on the platform that we're talking about, then you see that you're already breaking a lot of those barriers that we have today. And digital infrastructure, even more than physical infrastructure, is something of this age that must be done. And then we'll talk about energy, and then we'll talk about any other thing. Okay, but let me still stay with you for a second and talk about those that do not believe in opening up the market and the work that we need to do to, to evangelize and to build an understanding of the importance of this. And they are there. So what would you say okay. about that? And so with those, um, what the Afro champions, for example, tends to do is that what it brings, is it brings a role model. It brings a model of those who are actually doing it who believe in it, and they can see that that is working. And the one thing I've seen about role models is once you can put someone who is like me 
looks like me, talks like me, feels like me, eats like me, sleeps like me, does everything like me, then I say to myself almost immediately that if he can do it, if she can do it, I can as well. And that's the greatest thing as to what we are seeing in the new generation of African entrepreneurs, that those who believe in opening up, those who believe in traveling, those who believe in cross-cultural uh, integration, those who believe in multinational uh, beliefs are actually making a difference. And many other Africans are seeing that and following. Excellent. Thank you. So lead by example. Lead by example. Show, it, show, show the people that it's possible. Donald, let me come to you on something that I think is very close to so many African hearts. Um, if we look at many of our economies, the informal sector is the normal. And our informal sector has held up a lot of African countries. And yet, um, we don't often give the small and medium-sized enterprises maybe the room and the attention that they need. As we go into this era, I want to talk about access to finance for these kinds of businesses, for all these African businesses that need finance to grow to the next level, to scale up, to be able to leverage. Um, take us through the role of banking in all this, right? And, and I want to ask a sensitive question. If banks are not willing to step up and do the right thing for Africa, offering affordable, accessible funding, do we need disruption? Since the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, in the process of globalization, there have been some things which have accelerated and others which have decelerated. One thing which has accelerated enormously is our data. The amount of data available now is enormous to everyone at any time. But unfortunately, one thing which has decelerated is finance. Because of the errors made in 2008, there's now massive re-regulation. There's a lot of uh, risk aversion. Many banks, especially foreign banks, which are on the African continent, have gone back to their countries, remember Barclays, many others, because they go back to the environments they think they understand the risk they can manage. Now, I think this gives a special opportunity and task for African-owned banks. And I want to commend banks like EcoBank, UBS, and Bank, which have crossed the borders. It is time to innovate. It is time to look for ways in which we can propose new products for the kind of markets you are mentioning. It's too technical, I don't want to go into that today. But I'm saying, if these European banks are saying they are going back to their homelands, which they understand best, I think our banks now have an opportunity to actually open up, to rise up, and uh, propose new products for the kind of segments you mentioned. And I can go into that. Now, one smaller point here, also, which I should mention, is that it's not simply about banks. It's about banks, it's about non-bank financial institutions, and it's about regulators, the central banks. Because far too often, the, the banks, financial institutions, are not able to do things they do because there are regulations to be followed. And I do want to appeal here that regulators, banks, non-bank financial institutions, like insurance companies, it's an opportunity to come together and begin to cross borders as this uh, free trade era comes uh, into force. I am Dr. Amani Asfour. I am chairperson of the Comesa Business Council and president of the Egyptian Business Women Association. Thank you very much for the panelists. In order to have a free continental trade area, we need to have an African product which is powerful, standard, certified, that can meet all the standards of what we need. For the policies, and this is as we talk about dialogue, we need the governments to put two issues very important. Government procurement, because if we source all our government procurement from multinational companies, our African private sector will never grow. So we need a certain percentage of all the government procurement goes to African private sector, small medium enterprises. Hi, uh, my name is Karan Veer Singh, and I'm from a company called Yego Innovation based here in Rwanda. <laughs> one, one very important thing I think which uh, we need to consider is when we talk about execution and we talk about job creation, the key thing when governments decide to be able to implement something, 
uh, normally they give it down to the bureaucracy and then the bureaucracy comes in and they put in a lot of impedance. Let me just give you an example. If you, today I can arrive at the Kigali International Airport and instead of filling up a form or standing in a queue, I can basically just go and put my card and put my thumbprint and I can come in, right? So what have we got? You've got e-gates. So my, my suggestion is to the chairperson of the AU and to everybody else, whatever protocols, whatever procedures that you're going to put in to facilitate job growth and to facilitate economies of scale of coming up in your countries, please ensure that it is friction-free or frictionless so that we can come in. So I think that for me, while we can talk about all the solutions, but the creation of knowledge and the private sector know that repetition is what brings effect is something I think we should latch on. And now, now that the African Union has embarked on that, I think organs like ours and many others uh, should, should take it seriously and make sure that we deal with this issue of popularizing the agenda. Because I think that's what will also cause the leaders to start listening and changing, because that's how life is. Thank you. I would like to uh, just to point out that uh, we were talking about uh, some weaknesses and uh, and how and the relation between the private sector and uh, and the government very simple very simple way to address this is egov egov which means that dematerialization uh, and digitalization of a government which will make n less and less red tape so a faster doing business and a more comprehensive of what we should do to implement uh, to implement uh, an economic and social uh, and social uh, uh, dynamic. So, important to digitalize and to have more e-gov processes. Okay. And second, if you uh, if you allow me, the second is that cost of uh, we were talking about how uh, how government can help to have a a, um, a comprehensive connectivity uh, and, uh, and, uh, and um, distribution network that do cost us. Um, we had uh, this morning uh, an, um, an example. It does cost to, uh, to, to us 25% of our GDP, so we're not competitive. And sometimes it's easier to import from right. Asia than to consume from the sub, uh, to buy from the sub-region. So these are some uh, solutions to uh, to uh, thank you to a better um, partnership, public private. Thank you. Let me come to you, Donald, on the question on um, African products, capacity building, excellence, um, and procurement. You know, governments can really support the growth of of, of African products if we address issues of procurement. Uh, your thoughts? So, in a forum like this, I think it's important for business leaders themselves to understand that a wider market is in their interest. Because if they put pressure on their leaders, leaders, of course, have to listen to the population, and some of the leaders give in. In this region for a long time, in Comesa, governments feared that if they come together, there will be revenue loss. They fear that companies will close. In fact, revenues have increased dramatically. In fact, more companies have been created. So I'm appealing here to leaders of business to actually go and help political leaders to understand that a wider market is in the interest of all of us. As we come together in a free trade, we're not going to create an Africa behind barriers where we close out the rest of the world. We need technology, we need investments, and therefore, as we come together, because in a free trade area, you can still have different external tariffs. It's not like customs union. It is important to understand we still need the world, technology, knowledge. And therefore, for example, if you have got a railway to build, you could say, no, 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 I'm going to close this only for African railway builders. I will close out external technology. There might be a case for that, but you could also actually be losing out in terms of the recent technology. So balance between, yes, give uh, preference to your own people, but open up. Leadership sometimes not being knowledgeable, and therefore always hugging back to all these things that were so important many years ago, but are no longer important now because they have been superseded by events, is actually true. So we have to keep educating each other. Leaders, when they sit together at the 
AU, in, in Ari, so wherever they meet, they need to talk to each other um, candidly. But some of the obstacles that they keep throwing at each other that really are redundant, that we, need, we shouldn't be wasting time on. So um, uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the CFTA that we are trying to do here is not something that is being done for the first time. We are actually very late. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's benefited a lot of other regions. Uh, we should look at the successes that others who have gone before us have achieved. The EU has, uh, EU has been mentioned, NAFTA has been mentioned, ASEA has been mentioned. What are we waiting for? What sovereignty did the Europeans lose? I mean, except for the British we'll, who we are We can talking ask about the British it. about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me not go there. Thank Tony, you. Tony, please come in here. You know, um, so there's a point that was raised in the room. It's like the big elephant in the room between business and governments. Business will make profit. Any business that doesn't make profit is in trouble. Now, one of the things that we must understand, and I must say this out, is please do not be afraid of making businesses that make profit. Because it's the only way that Africa is going to rise. We go all over the world, and we are only allowed, when you get into a room where policies, where uh, the international community sits to make decision about the entire world. I look around and you will find one African in a room of a hundred people making decisions for us. And the only reason why is because we have not been able to raise ourselves up such that we have the economic power to sit in that room and make decisions that affect us. So it's extremely important that we must understand that we have to raise African giants, not just giants on, on the continent, but who are global powerhouses. So businesses must make a profit. And we want African businesses to be bold and big and do well. But I think it's the exploitation we must be careful about. And it's those are two different things. Totally different. Yes. Exploitation must stop. But there are so many African businesses that are doing well. Encourage them. Welcome them. Help them. Thank you. Ask them, what can we do to make life And indeed, easier? let's grow them. Let them employ they people. We need they them have to, to grow. grow. And they Miriam, will employ Africans. Thank you, Tony. Miriam, very briefly, and then I give the final word to Your Excellency. Thank you. OK, thank you, Juni. Uh, um, you know, creating, uh, having, being profitable and creating wealth, you don't share poverty. You share wealth. You have to create it, to transform it, to create more jobs. And, and, and we were talking about small countries. We were here in Rwanda, the best doing business in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the region. And we know that because we heard you, Claire, that because you no know, very light red tape, no red tape, very clear processes. So this is how we can create faster, more entrepreneurs, more inter more innovative entrepreneurs, and more wealth. So we can share it. There is no shame of creating wealth because this is what we share. Right. And at the end of the day, job creation, taxation, and we are uh, beneficial to the whole community and to the whole, to the whole economy. Excellent. We, there is no shame in creating wealth. We don't share poverty, we share wealth. That's quotable as well. Um, Your Excellency, I'll finish with you. I think um, a question was asked about the role of government in assisting this whole move by maybe having certain procurement rules. Um, there are other things I'm sure government can do. Maybe you can inspire us as we close this session. What do you see in terms of government really being a facilitator and what can you commit? Thank you. Thank you very much. First, I should say that um, capital is very sensitive. It goes where it feels comfortable, where it is not threatened. Whether an economy is big or as small as mine, but if the environment, the economic environment is comfortable for capital, it will come. For Zimbabwe, which has been under sanctions for about 18 years, we have to leapfrog to catch up with other developing countries. So we must create an environment where capital must 
feel comfortable. Secondly, I think it is also necessary that we look to an area of education which we have not touched on. I believe that um, our universities and institutions of higher learning should begin to produce products that talk to our vision as an African continent, rather than continue to churn out graduates uh, premised on a Western or Eastern uh, education trust. It is necessary that again, our industry and commerce talk to our institutions so that their curriculum produce products which relate and is able to talk to our own uh, industries. And reach the goal. Asante Sana, a big round of applause, bigger than that for the panel, please. And I'll finish with the words of our last speaker from the audience who really said we need to popularize this because at the end of the day, if Africans don't know what's in it for them, they will not be part of it, no matter what sector they come from. And so I end with these words uh, of African wisdom. A man does not go far from where his corn is roasting.